Hello, and welcome. I'm Glenn Torres-Pelisi, and this is 5 Minutes with the Professor. In this week's readings and lectures, we are discussing forms of property that a business can or maybe even will likely own. In the readings, we discuss laws covering certain forms of real property, means tangible property, land, possessions, as well as different forms of intellectual property. Now, for this five minutes podcast, I want to focus on intellectual property, in particular, one aspect of intellectual property that most modern companies deal with. It's your website and your domain name. Now, the importance of intellectual property to the modern corporation can hardly be understated. Whether the IP at issue is copyrighted material, that means songs or performances, patented material, perhaps a new way of putting together a computer chip, or the symbol of your company that you have worked so long and hard to establish as a symbol of value, protecting these IP rights is key to the success of your business. Now this is especially important for the online company, which all companies should be in the modern age, because your first interaction with your customer will probably be through the intellectual property of your website, the so-called virtual marketplace. Now, one of the most valuable assets a company can have in today's market is its domain name. You need your domain name to be easy to find, to be memorable and simple. It's the internet storefront of your brand. So you want something that both looks professional, but also attracts potential customers and is easy to find. So let's start with the basics. What is a domain name and how does it work? Well, and the most simplest way to explain it, perhaps, is that a domain name is your address on the internet. It's basically made up of two pieces of information, much like your house address. You know, your house address has your house and your street. Domain names are very similar. The first part of the domain name is known as the top-level domain. It's the .edu, it's the .com, it's the .edu and spcollege.edu, for example. It's the first piece of information that your web system needs to find your website. Basically, it tells your system, hey, look on .edu street for more information. Other common top-level domains, as I said, are .com for commercial, .org for nonprofits, .net, a catch-all. The TLD.gov is reserved for the government. Now, the second level domain, the SLD, is actually your location on the street, on EDU street, for example. SP College is our location. So when you type spcollege.edu into your browser, your operating system knows where to look. Now in 2012, in response to demand from the industry, ICANN, the organization which used to be overseen by the US government but is now fully independent, announced that companies could also purchase generic TLDs for an additional fee of about $185,000 plus an annual fee of $25,000. Now these generic TLDs can use any word at the end and many companies have purchased them to set up things like .pepsi or .android or .gmail, .toyota, etc, etc. But most individuals and small businesses can't afford to get their own uh, TLD, G, uh, GTLD. So they secure domain names through web hosting services like SiteGround, iPage, HostGator, Bluehost and GoDaddy, among thousands of others. Now, as a small business, you want to make sure you pick a reputable hosting service that has good stats with respect to downtime, as well as making sure that it offers features that meets your needs. For example, any commercial needs you might have, any selling you might do on your website. Now, given that the website of a company can be a significant source of income, it's perhaps unsurprising that certain nefarious individuals will try to trade off your hard work. But one of the ways they do this is through a practice known as cyber squatting. Basically, the individual registers a domain name that is similar to or the same as a popular brand. The idea is that a consumer may get confused and end up at the wrong site. When they view the site, there will be advertisements that, the pay, that pay the site owner a fee for each of the web hits the website receives. Sometimes cyber squatters don't intend to make actually any money from consumers. Rather, they are trying to get the brand to make them an offer to buy the domain name. And this has happened in all sorts of circumstances, including political circumstances. It's kind of like a ransom situation. The squatter is hoping that the company will simply pay rather than engage in extended litigation. 
Now, a special type of cyber squatting is known as typo squatting, and that's where a squatter intentionally misspells a brand name in hopes of tricking the consumers. So, what kind of laws regulate this type of behavior? Well, there are a few. At the international level, if you think a domain name violates your trademark, you may file for arbitration completely online under the Uniform Domain Name Resolution Policy, UDRP, which was established by ICON. Everyone agrees to this every time they register a website for the first time through any registrar wherever in the world. Now, it helps you if your mark has been violated internationally. Uh, it provides an easy process by which you can sue that person and ICANN will then transfer the domain into your possession. Now, you can't get any monetary damages, but it does provide quick relief. In the United States, in 99, the U.S. Congress passed an amendment to the Lanham Act called the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act, the ACPA, which strengthened the already strong existing IP protections in the U.S. The ACPA made cyber squatting illegal if the name is identical or confusingly similar to another company's mark, and if the accused had a bad faith intent to profit from that confusion. Now, the bad faith intent could either be a desire to confuse consumers or desire to extract a payment from the brand owner themselves. In short, the site would have no legitimate commercial purpose. Under the law, damages can range to $1,000 to $100,000 for each offending site, depending how bad the conduct of the defendant is. Just to give you an example, in 2008, Verizon won a $33 million judgment against the web, re web, web registration company Online NIC. They had registered over 600 addresses using a computer algorithm to generate website names based on many of the top brands of the day. For example, they owned MyVerizonWireless.com, iPhoneVerizonPlans.com, and VerizonCellular.com. Verizon initiated a lawsuit for trademark infringement, and the court found the defendants liable and ordered them to pay $50,000 per infringing site. It also ordered all the transfer of the ownership to the disputed sites to Verizon. So if your business is faced with this situation, you should be aware of your legal rights under both the UDRP and the ACPA. Recent court decisions are proving very favorable to businesses looking to protect their brands. And importantly, most of these cases can be settled out of court or through arbitration, so you don't have to bear the expense of litigation. Policing your domain name is a new added expense that businesses must plan for and beware of, but doing so is critical to maintaining the profitability of your online brand. That does it for this week's Five Minutes with the Professor. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the discussion board.